What's up, guys? Rick from DFS On Demand here with your DFS preview for this week's Farmers Insurance Open. This one I'm super stoked about because this is basically in my backyard. Not that close, but I live relatively close to Torrey Pines. So I will be on site uh, Thursday morning and Saturday during the day. Uh, if you're going to be on grounds, hit me up on Twitter. Love to uh, love to catch up. But there's a lot to go through, a lot of exciting stuff in addition to this tournament from the subscribers of DFSOnDemand.com, which is my website. It is where all of the tools and data that you see in these videos and hear about on the podcast it's where all that comes from. And it was a big week for us. So, um, you know, I personally, I mean, with two hours to go, was staring down uh, the Pat Mayo experience open win, uh, you know, five to seven grand worth of, of returns. Unfortunately, with answer flying up the leaderboard, Scotty Scheffler and Ricky Fowler both fading a little bit, not able to win the golf tournament. Uh, it was still a good day, but not a great day for me. But guys that did have great days, let's start with this. Invincible won the mini max. That's a great tournament to win. I believe it's a 50 cent uh, buy in, which is like 150 max entries. It's a really good ROI. Uh, Trent T used the core cascading method, which is the method that, that I use. And when that hits, uh, you're going to win a lot of money. So he had a lot of bullets, turned $60 into $574. Uh, three putts to par turned $45 into $537. King Chuckles, this is a good one, $86 into $3,500. Nice, love it. And then two guys, uh, Jesse J turned 118 into 907. Uh, Jesse J, I believe, finished second in the $1 short game to Stewie, Scott Stewart, who won that, turned his, I believe it's a $1 buy-in into $1,500. Both of those guys uh, in the Slack channel, we were sweating that out together in the DFS On Demand Slack channel, which was a lot of fun, really cool. So congratulations to everyone. It was a, a great week. And, you know, here's to another great week coming up. Additionally, if you'd like to get access to the DFS On Demand tools, the things that helped some of these subscribers win some cash, you can certainly do so. Uh, there's a way to enter a contest where I will pick uh, two names each week to win a week's access to DFS On Demand. So winners from last week, Rob in Pittsburgh and Razor's Edge. If you have not heard from me yet, I will get in contact with you, get you set up for that free week. And the way to get entered into a draw for this week is as follows. Two ways. If you're listening to this on the audio podcast, uh, go leave a five-star rating and review. Say something nice about the show and leave me your Twitter handle. That's the easiest one to win because not many people do it any every single week. Or if you're watching on YouTube, uh, make sure that you are already subscribed to the channel. Make sure you like the video and comment with who's going to win this. But here are the options. You can get the guys who are over... $10,000. So I believe there's five of them this week. Rory, Rom, uh, Tiger is up there. I think Xander's up there. And whoever else is over 10K, either one of those guys is going to win it or the field is going to win it. You have to tell me the 10K guys or the field. Uh, leave that below and I will pick a name from both of them. If you want to double your chances, go ahead and enter uh, contests on both sides. It helps us all. All right. I think that's it. A lot of cool stuff going on this week and super excited about it. Let's jump into the Farmers Insurance Preview. All right, a few things to know off the bat for Torrey Pines and the Farmers Insurance Open. Similar to last week, we are going to get a course rotation at Torrey Pines because there's two courses on site there. There is the north course and there is the south course. The way this is going to work is each golfer will play both courses one time before the cut. So we're going to have our 36-hole traditional cut, top 65 and ties, but each golfer is going to play the north and the south. And then for the weekend, it is solely the South course, which is the harder course. That is the course that is going to be the host for the U.S. Open next year in 2021. So uh, three rounds at the South course and one on the North course if you play all four rounds. They're making the North course more difficult, but it is historically the much easier course. In fact, last year it played to the fifth easiest uh, scoring average or, or to par average, while the South course was the 18th most difficult 
out of the 49 PGA Tour event. So you really want to be able to make your hay on the one round that you have at the North Course. Additionally, past champions here, um, not talking about top fives, top tens, or anything, but historically, the big dogs, the studs, have won at Torrey Pines, and I think there's a few reasons for that. But before we jump in, past winners, Justin Rose, he's your defending champion. Jason Day, John Rahm, Brant Snedeker won in that year that... Remember, it was like 50 mile an hour wins on Sunday. Everything went sideways. He was like the only guy under par. I think he was one under. And um, like the rest of the field just absolutely collapsed. The video from that year is is insane. I highly recommend going back and watching some of that. It's a lot of fun. Um, and then Jason Day, again, for the second time, won it five years ago. So those are big names, which kind of makes sense because this is where a lot of the studs generally like to start their season. Tiger's here, Rory's here, Rom is here, Justin Rose is here. Like when you get these uh, these big names, you know, one of them tends to win it. And Tory's hard. Uh, you know, I've played both courses there multiple times. The South course for me, obviously, if you hit one in the rough, you that's a two shot penalty. Like I'm dead out of there. The stuff is very thick and it's very, it's a very long course. So you need to not only be accurate, but you need to be long. And then, uh, the greens, when you get on them are putting like, it's like putting on glass. So it, it tends to be a quite difficult event and the big names and the cream tends to rise to the top so let's jump over to the cheat sheet and see some of these big names here out of the gate five guys over ten thousand dollars rory leads the way at eleven thousand six hundred john rom at eleven three tiger at ten eight justin rose at ten three xander shoffley at ten one this is a really interesting situation because history and kind of just like the total implied win equity of these golfers you would think like one of these guys is pretty likely to win the golf tournament now you are going to you're not going to be able to get two of these guys in your lineup right without completely compromising everything else that's going on so you're going to have to decide which one of these guys is the play we know that tiger woods has won here like seven times he's making his debut I like to see Tiger after he's played a little bit more, right? You know, uh, he's had a, some trouble warming up in recent years at at Torrey. You know, the back kind of gets going, can be a little chilly in the morning. Um, but he does have back-to-back -to -back top 25s here. I think if I'm going to spend ten and a half or eleven thousand dollars i'm just going to go straight to the top with rory mcelroy who uh one of the best off the tee players in the world he is the best off the tee player in the world last time we saw him he won the wgc event he finished third at the zozo and he doesn't play tory a lot played it last year finished fifth so i think if i'm just going to spend up and it's not really a knock against rom i mean i like rom here too rose is okay i think i'd probably just go get rory now xander is interesting what's uh, interesting for a lot of reasons he's the cheapest of these guys he's 10,100 saw him play awesome at the tournament of champions saw him play awesome at the wgc second place finishes in both of those a 10th at the zozo so i mean coming in recent form there are few guys in this field that are going to be able to boast a resume as good as xander's is the problem is for this being uh, like literally xander's home course i'm pretty sure this guy he's definitely a san diego kid i think he went to tory pines high school like this should be, uh, but I mean, sometimes we see that going home and then having media obligations and having friends and family hitting you up for tickets and all that stuff. Maybe it's more distractions, but three cuts in a row missed before last year for Xander in which he finished 25th. I would argue Xander has been on this, um, you know, upswing, this trajectory of his career that he's a much different golfer than he even was two, three years ago. I think we still haven't even seen the best of Xander. So I, I think he's the other guy out of the 10 Ks that I would probably be more comfortable playing. So uh, going up and getting Rory paying the full price or being down in the bottom of the range at 10, one probably trying to stay out of the middle guys and hope that they don't kill me. Now the nine K range is probably where after all that being said, the nine K is probably where uh, GPPs will be won and lost here. You've got, guys with uh great form coming in great history i don't know how many of these guys you could you could pile up here but i mean let's like hideki matsuyama um uh, 12th at the sony 11th at the wgc i mean he's got five straight top 15 finishes and his last two years here a third place finish and a 12th place finish this is a place where you've got to be good off the tee you have to be a great uh ball striker he's great with his long irons that that like that fits 
Hideki. If he can putt a little bit, he's going to be in contention. Um, then, okay, I'll skip Ricky Fowler for one second. I think Gary Woodland probably will be the chalkiest guy here, right? He's 9,500, um, seventh at the Tournament of Champions, fifth at the Zozo, third at the CJ Cup. And look at this recent form here at Tory. Four straight top 20 finishes. A ninth last year, 12th, 20th, and 18th. That is probably a guy who garners a lot of ownership. So if you're going to play Gary, that's fine. I, I like to look at ownership as a whole, uh, a whole for my lineup as opposed to just one single golfer. But if you're going to play Gary, you're probably going to want to differentiate a little bit. Maybe that's with Rose and Gary. Maybe that's with um, Ricky Fowler, who I think is, I don't know what's going to happen with Rick, Ricky this week. I think it's a really interesting case study because we talk about the perception of a finish all the time where if Rick, if you sort of told us Ricky Fowler was going to finish 10th at the, at the American express, we'd probably be like, okay, that's fine. Like whatever. But the way that he did it, which is 15 under par through two rounds, um, the odds on favorite to win this thing. And then he kind of fades on the weekend. Doesn't look so good. Guys who rostered Ricky last week and there wasn't many of them probably don't want to roster him again this week. Throw in the fact that's kind of been a little bit of a, a bloodbath for Fowler, three straight missed cuts and a 66th last year in his last four trips. Ricky's probably the guy that gets overlooked here. So if you can stomach going back to him, I think he's probably the pretty significant leverage play in the 9K range. I do think Patrick Reed becomes a little bit interesting here at 92. So missed the cut at the Sony Open, which we kind of knew, right? We we knew he was going to be fool's gold uh, after the fact that he had gained so many strokes the week before putting at the Tournament of Champions. So I'll pull this up right here. Here is Patrick Reed, for those of you watching on the video, his strokes gain database uh, for his last handful of tournaments. And that Tournament of Champions round, uh, the, or tournament, 9.3 strokes gained putting we knew that was a little bit of fool's gold and he was probably going to regress a little bit which he did at the sony open and ended up missing the cut and he lost two strokes putting but i think there's still some good takeaways there like he's not going to lose putting that often right i mean you know once out of every five or six tournaments you see patrick reed lose strokes putting but um even at sony which is where he missed the cut gained strokes off the tee gained on approach gained tee to green of course so uh, i think there are some pretty decent takeaways for a guy who now probably people forget about don't want to roster again and he's got two straight top 25s here at uh here at tory pines Jason Day at 9,000 feels like a pretty, <laughs> a pretty big trap, to be quite honest. You know, he missed the cut at Mayakoba. He withdrew from the President's Cup, citing that, uh, you know, back injury again. But the, the tournament history, the course history here is, is second to none. He's got two wins in his last five starts. He added a fifth place finish last year. Um, I'm not touching him. I, I don't trust the guy. I think there's better options. Sung Jay is a hundred dollars more. And then some of the young guys, Colin Morikawa, Scotty Scheffler, they are a few hundred dollars less. Um, that, like I'd much rather play those guys. So, so Jason Day's again, probably a pretty big leverage spot, but I don't think it's, it's good leverage. Now in that 8k range, <laughs> there's J uh, Jordan Spieth's here, by the way, 8,500, um, Cam Smith at 87. I know we just won at the Sony Open, and we don't usually back guys up right away after a win, but it has been a week off, and this has been a pretty good extended run of golf from Cam Smith. We're talking the win at the Sony, the uh, third place finish at the CJ Cup, and a 13th at the Shriners. Let me pull up his uh, strokes gain database here for one second and see if we can see any trends here. Yeah, and what's really good to see is Cam Smith really struggled. T to green from the Honda Classic to the Travelers. So that would have been last February to last June. He lost strokes T to green every single tournament. It was not a good run for him. Since uh, and it was a it was a seven tournament stretch. Since then in the what is that? Nine tournaments since, he's gained strokes T to green in eight of them which is obviously a really good sign that he's that he's gaining on the field. He's popped off a couple of times, you know, a, a, a handful of top 12 finishes. You know, he's got four top 13 finishes, including a win in those nine starts. He's only missed the cut in two of them. Um, I think that he's someone that is certainly trending in the right direction, and he actually 
is one of the better players kind of historically in terms of strokes gained at uh, at Torrey Pines. You can see that in the results a little bit. Ninth place finish last year, 20th in 2018, and 33rd in 2017. So $8,700 for a guy who is probably playing the best golf of his career. I mean, played well at the President's Cup too, but probably the best golf of his career right now at a spot that he's historically had success at. Uh, that is the type of combination that that I really do like to see. And then down here in the value ranges, you know, I, I like a lot of these guys to, I don't like them to win necessarily, but to put up, you know, top top 10, top 15 finishes, Lonto again, you know, we I play Lonto all the time and I'll show him in the value matrix in a second. He's 7,900 coming off a seventh place finish at the Sony, only played here once. It was a 12th place finish two years ago. Someone like a... Um, well, Jason Kokrak, I'll talk about in a second, but uh, Harris English, who has you know multiple top eight finishes here in the last five years, Keegan Bradley is seventy three hundred dollars. He's coming off a twelfth place at the Sony. He's got back to back top fives two and three years ago. Like there are actually some playable names down here if you want to ride hot hands. All of those guys that we saw last week: Sepp Straka, Tom Hoagie, Adam Shank. Like all those guys who finished in the top ten last week, trying to back that up. I mean. Sepp Strzok, I'm not necessarily always a huge fan of him, but he does pop off, right? I mean, a fourth place at Houston, a fourth place at the Amex. He had three missed cuts in between that, which is that kind of that volatile, volatile aspect of him. But he did finish 13th at Torrey last year. So, I mean, you can you can find some of these guys out here lurking a little bit if you want to go back to them. But I want to talk a little bit more about value and show you the value matrix, which is a, a fun little tool that I use. And... Uh, what this shows is basically um, average salary, average value, uh, or average DraftKings points, which then turns into average value, right? So what I like to do for this, um, I want to shorten up the dates a little bit because this goes back at least two years. So I'm going to go back from the start of last year, January of 2019, and I want to look for guys just when they cost under eight thousand dollars. That tends to be the the value spot, and you can see, um, you know, Colin Morikawa leads the way here as the most valuable. It's only five starts, but he, you know, averaged seventy one hundred uh dollars on DraftKings and then was returning, you know, pretty ridiculous numbers, uh eleven and a half times value, which is a massive number. But he's not under eight thousand this week. Um guys that are Jason Kokrak. So it was it was almost laughable that Kokrak was I think ninety one hundred dollars last week, something like that. Um, but you see, every time he's been under eight thousand dollars, he's act he's been, no, I shouldn't say every time. Nothing is every time, but he's been pretty good. Uh, WGC HSBC that was just at the end of last year. He was sixty seven hundred, returned eighty seven DraftKings points. That's thirteen times value. Two starts before that, thirteen times value. BMW eleven times, eleven times, twelve times. I mean, that's. Four, uh, five of his last six times he's been under eight thousand dollars, he has returned at least eleven times value. That's a pretty good run. And Kokrak, um, I know, has played Tory before. I think he's had a, a a little bit of success. Let's go find him really quickly here. Uh, seventy seven hundred this week. Yeah, twentieth last year. Didn't play in twenty eighteen. Missed the cut in 2017 and 25th in 2016. So two top 25s in his last three starts around here. Um, he missed that cut at the American Express last week. So he is certainly not going to be very, very popular. But these are the types of guys that I'm looking for when I get down into this range here. Like who else might we see this week under $8,000? Maybe a Bo Hogue. Um, I, you know, it's funny. I, um... I rostered a lot. I had him in my uh, Bo Hogue in my core last week, and he technically withdrew. Uh, at some point during the third round, he withdrew. He was going to miss the cut, uh, but I think he had the flu, and after like seven or eight holes, ended up withdrawing, which might actually speak to why he was so bad last week and hoping if he's feeling better and heading to Tory, uh, this might be a pretty good spot for him. But I mean, if you look at the numbers here, you know, he's almost always under $7,000. In fact, I don't have a tournament in which he was more than $7,000. Exactly. He was 7,000 at the Bermuda, which is like, you know, the weakest field that's going to be his highest salary ever. Um, and, and routinely returns you nine, 10, 11 times value. 
At the Sony, he gave you 12 times value. At Mayakoba, he gave you 13, 15 in Bermuda, 11 and 10 at the Shriners and the Safeway, nearly 10 at Sanderson Farms. Like a really good price. He's $6,500 again this week. I would consider it. I might give him one more chance here. Uh, right off last week's debacle as kind of a flu type situation, it might give him one more crack at it. Let's also jump over to the course key stat. So if you're new, welcome. Uh, this is a statistical model, a regression model that I put together every single week, which looks at, uh, to me, this is trying to be more predictive than some of the more reactive things that are out there. But uh, it looks at the year-long PGA Tour stats rankings, basically, and then compares them to uh, the success at each one of the courses on the PGA Tour, and it finds what type of player, what type of player would have success at each one of these courses. And it's a little bit wonky when we have two courses out there, but uh, for this week at the Farmers Insurance, the things that pop off a little bit, strokes gain, strokes gain putting, actually one of the more uh, important stats. It ranks 14th out of 50 of the most common, or I'm sorry, 14th here at Torrey Pines out of 50 PGA Tour courses. And it kind of makes sense because these are really tricky greens. I mean, I don't want to act like I know anything about golf or anything like that, but when you play Torrey, uh, what's really deceptive about it is everything goes towards the ocean, which makes sense, but not like when you're looking at it and you're guaranteeing there's no way this thing goes to the ocean, it still goes to the ocean, which is, it's, really kind of screws with your brain a little bit and local knowledge, course knowledge, being able to figure that out. I mean, Tiger's won here seven times. I know that's kind of a, a crutch to stand on because Tiger's won a lot of places, but got like we've seen experienced golfers win here. Um, and then driving accuracy, which is kind of what I mentioned off the top. You know, um, we usually don't see driving accuracy be this high at some of these courses, but I mean, it's, it's goes back to the rough being so thick here and so penal that if you are hitting out of it, you're, you're in big trouble. Uh, and then you get these hard, fast greens and you can't stop the ball on it cause you can't spin it. And it kind of makes sense. So let's look through the, we'll start with those two stats here. So let's look at guys who lead in strokes gain putting. And obviously, um, you know, if they, if something is blank here, it's because they don't have enough rounds to qualify. So we're still early in the year as these golfers get more measured rounds, you know, as Rory, uh, gets more measured rounds, like we're going to see those guys on there. But, uh, for now, Billy Horschel leads this field in strokes gain putting, uh, Denny McCarthy. He almost always leads the tour in strokes gain putting Pat Perez, kind of interesting. So Pat Perez, um, having a pretty good start to the year. He's a very accurate driver. You can see him uh, right here, 65% fairways, which is one of the, the higher numbers in the field. Makes a lot of, um, has historically made a lot of birdies. Ken is having a good putting season so far, and he's a San Diego guy, right? He's local. He's played here a lot. I see him like every year when we come out here. Let's see, $7,000 on the dot. Missed the cut last year. 2018, I think he was injured. I think that was the year he had the wrist thing and um, was it a wrist thing or did he like tear his ACL? Whatever it was, Pat Perez was hurt. Um, didn't play in 2018, fourth in 2017. So he has had really good finishes here. Third place at the Shriners, eighth at the Mayakoba coming in, 45th at the Sony. So kind of flying a bit underneath the radar. I, I might consider Pat Perez. Um, I will probably be overweight on Pat Perez because I don't think he's going to be that highly owned, but he's the type of guy that would absolutely fit this. Uh, Dom Buzelli and Lanto Griffin round out the top five in strokes game putting. And my buddy Cam Smith is number six driving accuracy. Let's go there. Cause I really do like it for this week because of course I prefer if you're a long end straight, someone like a Justin Rose, who is, you know, third on this list. Rose is hit 73% of his fairways. Gary Woodland, uh, probably statistically this year, one of the longer guys off the tee. He's also very accurate. That's why he tends to have a lot of good success here. But the top five is as follows. It's Satoshi, Satoshi Kadaira and KJ Choi. Realistically, hitting fairways is all those guys do. I could not possibly roster any of them. Uh, Justin Rose, Gary Woodland, both very intriguing because of this specific skill set. And then, you know, you put an iron in their hands. You hope their putter gets hot. Uh, that's the type of recipe for success. And then you get, you know, a lot of these lower owned guys, uh, Matthew Neesmith at 6,600, Scott Brown, Doc Redman, Henrik Nordlander. Like these are guys that are probably not that much in play, but at least they're not going to kill you 
off the tee. Tim Wilkinson's like 12th on this list. He played well coming down the stretch last week at the American Express. But um, let's try a couple other stats, ones that are historically more sticky. Strokes gained approach. Tony Finau leads the way. 1.5 strokes gained per round on the PGA Tour, followed by Kyle Stanley and Matt Every. Every hasn't been playing well, and he withdrew recently. I'd probably stay away from him. Ryan Palmer, Colin Morikawa, they round out the top five. And then um, my, you know, my favorites that is really Tito Green here, which it is a small sample, but Tony, um, this is this is very much boosted by the third round, I believe it was, that he had at the American Express on the stadium course where he where he went out and shot, you know, ten under par or something crazy like that. Um, you know, he's gaining like three point four strokes on the field, which is a massive number. Uh, Joel Damon, uh, seventy four hundred, I believe he withdrew last week, so he would probably be pretty low owned. Usually very accurate. Let's go check him. Seventy four hundred. See if he has any history here at Tory. I think he does. All right, twelfth at the Sony. I think he withdrew from the American Express before it started. Um, so I'll have to look into that. 12th at the Sony, missed the cut at the RSM, 6th at Mayakoba, good stretch there. 9th at the Shriners earlier in the year, good good there. 9th place finished last year here at Torrey Pines. Maybe Joel Damon is a guy that gets into uh, a handful of our lineups. He's someone that I could con- consider playing in a big way. Um, but that's probably it. I mean, again... This, this is another one of these unique weeks with a, a, a course rotation. So if you're playing showdown, you probably want to rely on some of the north course guys over the south course because that's the side that's going to uh, yield a lot more birdies, for example. But this is a really fun week, and it's not going to be 30 under par. Um there's going to be some bite out there. Some guys are going to make some bogeys, which is, you know, rare considering what we saw last week. And there's a lot of big names here. So it should be a lot of fun. If you'll be at Tory this week, hit me up. Let me know on Twitter. It's at Rick Run Good. Best of luck this week. Talk to you guys soon.